Hello and welcome back to the Temporal and Interspatial Misplacement Engine Machine, also known as Time Machine. This is the Marvel Project, the ongoing series where I travel back in time and read every single Marvel comic book available to me as it's being released. I'm here in August of 1939 where some mysterious entity has dropped off at my doorstep every single Marvel comic book through the end of the year 1940. A lot of these don't even exist yet, so as for where they came from, no idea. We'll figure that out later, but for now we've got 11 more issues to talk about until we're done with the year 1940. Uh, if you haven't seen my previous video, you should definitely go check that out because uh, that introduced a lot of the characters we're going to be talking about today, and I don't have the time or energy to go back and recap all that for you. So, better for both of us if you just go watch that. <laughs> I guarantee you, even if you think you're a Marvel expert, you've never heard of any of these characters before, or at least most of them. No need to draw this out any further, let's go ahead and get started with Daring Mystery Comics number 5, released in June 1940. In case you're new around here, the comics from this time period generally contain multiple storylines, each focusing on a different character. First up, we've got the Fiery Mask, someone we haven't seen since all the way back in Daring Mystery Comics number 1. Right away, we're introduced to Dork the Evil Scientist. No, 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 no way. Dork? Yeah, Dork. Dork unleashes a deadly protoplasm that turns at least one poor soul into a skeleton. Dork's men try to kidnap a woman in the name of experimentation, but the fiery mask jumps in just in time to save her. He throws the offender into the flesh-eating goop, which isn't murder because he's wearing a protective suit. With no fear, the fiery mask runs into the ooze to figure out just what's going on. There's something about turning people into skeletons that I think is just the perfect comic book villain thing. Uh, like. Just turning someone full force from a human into a skeleton, there's something so delightfully comic booky about that that I just love. Once inside Dork's base, the mask beats up all the bad guys, but will he be able to defeat Dork's superb creation? Yes. In the climactic confrontation, Dork shoots at the fiery mask but misses. The shot hits the window and the terrible gunk starts piling in. Dork gets turned into a skeleton. Ah, oh, man. But the mask escapes with the help of his heat-related superpowers. He breaks the machine that makes the slime, and the day is saved. Next is Trojak. I hate Trojak. He is easily my least favorite character that we've encountered so far. Uh, so I'm just going to do us all a favor and skip past this as quickly as I can. Trojak has to take the life juice from the devil flower, which is going to be a problem because the flower is the god of a nearby native tribe. They use the wrong there. Trojak fights some humans, a hyena, then a crocodile, also a gorilla. They get the devil flower juice and that's it at the end. K4 and his sky devils. This one's more sky devils and not so much K4. The sky devils get kidnapped by Nazis, but they quickly escape by doing the old kill the bad guys and take their clothes trick. K4 hears about this and instantly flies off to the rescue. He bombs the Nazi camp, which seems reckless considering he knows his squad is being held there. They get out just in the nick of time and then we switch over to Monaco, Prince of Magic. See, I have my own personal theories about Monaco. I don't have a lot backing this up other than his seemingly limitless power, but I think personally that Monaco is some kind of bored god. We get to learn a bit about Monaco's origin story. See, it all goes back to his childhood in India. After the sudden disappearance of his entire family, Monaco was taken in by a magic-wielding tribe. When Monaco was only 16, British troops arrived and wiped out the entire tribe. No, 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 it's okay. The tribe was cruel, so you don't have to worry about this at all. You don't even have to worry about it at all. It's perfectly fine. Just as he finishes his story, a woman gets kidnapped and thrown into the ocean. Monaco stops this just in time. He uses magic to mess with and interrogate those responsible. They get locked in the brig and the story ends. Marvex the super robot, being of the fifth dimension, is trapped by the insidious Dr. Nar. Once inside his lair, Marvex tries to escape, but Dr. Nar uses his magnetic ray device to paralyze his mechanical brain. Marvex lets out a desperate cry for help using his radio mind. Clara Crandall, you know, Clara Crandall. Clara Crandall hears the message and sets out to stop the sinister scientist. She smashes the control panel, allowing Marvex to spring into action. The doctor, having now lost his mind, jumps out the window and dies. The entire base explodes, and our heroes go on their way. I love the nonchalant attitude that a lot of Golden Age superheroes seem to have about casualties and collateral damage. Like, oh, that building was just reduced to rubble. Yeah, and? Whirlwind Carter of the Interplanetary Secret Service. Uh, I actually forgot about this guy, if we're being honest. This story starts with our titular character sitting in his... telescope chamber? Don't talk to me unless you have at least one telescope chamber. In his study, Carter discovers the existence of these evil space monsters known as 
the Black Light Men. Their goal? To change the Earth's orbit so dramatically that it freezes and then once all life has died off, sell it to Mars, what else? Obviously, Whirlwind Carter has to step in. The space monsters start to act out their plan, resulting in gravity being destroyed. The intergalactic forces of Earth and Venus force the Black Light Men to flee, causing gravity to quickly revert back to normal, killing and injuring millions. Great job, guys. Another easy victory for the Interplanetary Secret Service. The armies of Earthlings and Venusites discover that the monsters are afraid of fire. So holding torches, they chase the bad guys off a cliff and they all die. Look! The Earth is completely normal! Sands a million or so deaths. Next is a classic no pictures story. I talked about this in my last video, but every so often they like to throw in a story into these issues of daring mystery and Marvel mystery comics that doesn't have any pictures, so I tend to just skip over these. Breeze Barton in Rebuilding the World. If you'll recall, the last Breeze Barton story was, uh, really something. This one builds on the events of the previous story, which is tough because I basically skipped it in the last video. What you need to know is that Breeze and his buddies are going to build a new city. What's up with that guy's hat? I bet the guy at the store told him he was the only guy he'd ever seen pull it off. They basically get in a big fight, and then when they kill the enemy leader, all the bad guys give up, and the story ends. And now a new character that's unlike anything you've ever seen before. You've heard of Hercules, but let me introduce you to little Hercules. He's the smartest and strongest boy in the world, it's Little Hercules! This book written by the Screen Actors Guild. This 12-year-old prodigy invented a brand new type of bomb, so all scientists of the world unilaterally decided to make him a doctor of all the sciences. I have to admit it, Little Hercules is actually pretty funny. The first story of this video that I actually recommend to you, uh, which is not so bad considering we're still on our first issue of the night. Everyone keeps trying to steal Little Herc's secret formula, but he's basically invincible and infinitely strong, so this is not even slightly a challenge for him. He delivers the recipe to the president or something and the story ends. <sighs> Let's finally finish Daring Mystery Comics number 5. We've been here way too long. The Falcon! No, not that Falcon. The Falcon is investigating a mysterious death. The only clue? The Wand of Death. He immediately figures out the culprit, but can't do anything about it because magic apparently doesn't hold up in court. But it turns out it wasn't magic. It was a lethal static shock. No, not that static shock. The Falcon kills the bad guy, the end. Now let's move on to the other ongoing series that we have going on. That's Marvel Mystery Comics number 8, which, according to the cover, contains the first crossover event in Marvel history. It's not the main part of the cover, but it is on there. Instead of the Human Torch, we start this issue off with a Submariner adventure, a change so drastic they had to assure readers up front. To send a message to the Human Torch, his new enemy, Namor sets off a bomb that floods a tunnel underneath the Hudson River. Then he goes to the zoo and unleashes the lions, snakes, and elephants. Somebody call Kazar. A nurse drops a baby and just leaves it there, so Namor takes a break from destroying humanity for a minute to save the baby. He calls them all stupid idiots again and starts to destroy the George Washington Bridge. Just then, who arrives but the Human Torch? This is genuinely a huge moment for Marvel Comics. Before this, there was hardly any proof that these characters even existed in the same world, and now they're interacting with each other. This would actually go on to change how comic books are written, at least for Marvel. Human Torch attacks Namor with fire, which, as we all know, forces his body to act like a sprinkler. Uh, he leaps into the ocean and the story ends. Wait, just like that? But wait, it keeps going, because next we have the Human Torches book. Oh, okay, so we get to see the rest of the fight then. When Namor destroys the elevator train, Torch destroys the wall of the police precinct to chase him down. He fixes the Ocean Dweller's damages and meets with Betty, the Submariner's only human acquaintance. She tries to talk him out of fighting Namor, but the android's mind is made up. Just then, Namor destroys the Empire State Building, so the Torch destroys Betty's car as he flies to the rescue. Then he goes and cleans up Namor's zoom mess, but not before fighting a gorilla. Okay, uh, so far that's two gorilla fights and zero human torch and submariner fights. The story ends the exact same way as Namor's story. Okay, so uh, I guess we're gonna have to wait another month for them to actually fight. Uh, at least they've met. What else do we have in this issue? The Angel, our favorite serial killer. This time he gets kidnapped by the bad guys. His daring escape comes when he sticks his hands in the fire so the rope holding his hands together burns off. He beats up the bad guys and saves the girl. The Masked Raider, a historically exciting and not at all repetitive story, comes next. This time, the Masked Raider teams up with Mexican Pete to stop a group of bank robbers. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, Me Mexican Pete? Okay. The Raider gets tied up and burned down when good old Mexican Pete comes to the rescue. 
The two chase down the gang of thieves and bring them to justice by tripping them with a tripwire. The brains of the operation is revealed to be the bank president. Again, a completely original twist that I've never read in a book like this before. Electro, the marvel of the age. Well, he's definitely something. Some gangsters working for Sarpo kidnap Professor Zog and force him to pilot Electro for their nefarious purposes. Even if you did watch the last video, that sentence was probably nonsense. So Zog sends the robot to break the mob boss out of prison and go on a terrible crime spree. The police and militia arrive to take out this electronic threat. Just then, aliens from outer space show up to fight Electro? Zog and Electro are then loaded onto a spaceship and blasted into space? What? Up next is another ferret adventure with no pet ferret in sight. Oh, oh wait, hold on, whoa, 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 we're just, we're just gonna move on? I mean, that was insane. I mean, this is a normal book, as normal as a book can be that stars an electronic robot and a scientist named Philo Zog, but, but aliens? They just like show up and abduct them? We're not talking about this enough. A anyway, Ferret fights some small-time criminals. I'll be honest, I couldn't stop thinking about the aliens while I was reading this one. Adventures of Kazar the Great. More like Kazar the whatever. A rich Englishman scouts out his newly inherited gold mine, which just so happens to be in Kazar's territory. How will he run said gold mine? Well, he certainly won't enslave the native population. In fact, he'll pay them well to work in the mine because these people who live in the jungle will definitely have a use for English money. His travel companion shoots him to death, so it doesn't matter anyway. The bad guy does make use of slave labor, so Kazar hunts him down and crushes him with an elephant. That is all for this issue. Now that we're reacquainted with some of our old favorite characters that we're gonna be following for the rest of this video, we're gonna enter into the lightning round. Now in the lightning round, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna summarize every story in 50 words or less, uh, unless something really interesting happens that I just have to talk about. This should move us through things a whole lot quicker. Let's kick this lightning round off with Marvel Mystery Comics number nine. We continue the exciting fight between the Human Torch and the Submariner. Namor shoots the torch with pressurized air, forcing his flame off. Then he throws him off the torch of the Statue of Liberty. Hammond escapes the Submariner's trap just in time and the two chase each other across the city. The Submariner lands in a swimming pool and drowns because, of course, he can't breathe in water that has chlorine. The army arrives and bombs the pool, which, rather than harm Namor, launches them out of the water and onto the land where he regains consciousness. The Human Torch traps Namor in fire, which singes his little ankle wings. Namor steals a plane and the torch blows it up. Then he swims away, so Torch decides to go back to the police station. Betty insists that she can convince Namor to leave, and that all this violence is unnecessary, which is of course preposterous. The commissioner suggests using chemicals to kill Namor. Sir Hammond goes to ask for a chemical that will, quote, burn the Submariner off the face of the planet. The chemist suggests sulfuric acid to melt the half-man's skin off. After hurling bottles and bottles of skin-melting acid at the Submariner, Namor counters by blowing up the room with a vat of nitroglycerin. He then traps the torch in a huge glass slash rubber tube, but he didn't think he'd get this far, so he has no idea what he's gonna do next. And neither do I, because the story ends there. Okay, okay, I know we just started the lightning round and that was way more than 50 words, but if anything calls for breaking the lightning round, it's that. I mean, that was the first crossover fight in Marvel history and not to mention every single development in that story was way more wild than the last. Also, it was double length, so there you go. Lightning round starts now, for real. It's vampire night and only one man can rid the city of monsters. The angel tracks the vampire to its castle to find not a bloodsucker, but a mad scientist. The angel fights the doctor and explodes the castle. This story also contains the third gorilla fight today. I'm actually really enjoying this issue so far. I don't know, maybe I'm just in a good mood, but that Submariner and Human Torch fight was genuinely probably the most interesting thing we've seen so far, and that angel story wasn't too bad either. What's next? The Masked Raider. Okay. Some bandits attempt a stagecoach robbery, but the Masked Raider steps in and scares them off. He meets up with our old pal, Mexican Pete. Look, is Mexican Pete offensive? I don't know, probably. But is he also kind of my favorite character in this entire series? Yeah, 
The coach robbers try to steal some gold. Pete and the raider put a stop to this by marking the gold and then arresting them when they tried to sell it. We're now back with Electro. Wait, everyone shut up, I have to know what happens next. The aliens torture Zog until he agrees to use Electro for their own gain. The dragon aliens threaten the queen of the lion aliens, who is, for some reason, a human woman. With Electro's aid, the queen is captured and fed to the giant octopus monster. Electro rebels, and the queen is saved. This is still just so bizarre. I mean, the story ends and Philozog is just like, still in space? Somewhere? A Stacy Cleaner's warehouse is bombed by a man with a hook hand, so naturally Ferret has to investigate. He gets kidnapped, but cracks the case anyway. Whatever, still no pet Ferret. Finally, we have Kazar, who in this issue meets a girl. In the quest to find her father, another old white guy bent on making the island his own, Kazar needlessly kills a lot of indigenous people. Pretty much par for the course at this point. With the help of Trajao the previously mad elephant, father and daughter are reunited. And that does it for Marvel Mystery Comics number 9. Well, except for this weird one-page thing at the end that's all about sea creatures or whatever, I don't know. Moving on! Lightning round and all that. Red Raven Comics number one, a brand new series, and what's this? That's only 33 pages long. That's like half the length of a mystery comic. We're gonna get through this in no time. We're breaking the lightning round briefly for the man himself, the Red Raven. When a plane crashes in the Pacific, the sole survivor is taken in by a race of bird people. This is the Red Raven. He must leave his skyward paradise to create a better world for the wingless humans. He is immediately captured by a greedy mobster who traps him in a chamber that will age him 100 years in an hour so that he dies of old age. How? He also throws a woman in there and, oh, oh aging gas. That, that actually raises more questions. He escapes and kills the bad guy. When he reports back to the bird people, the king tells him to stay on Earth so he can kill the rest of the bad guys. Okay. He beats up more bad guys, with a pun this time, and gets captured at the enemy base. He drowns the villains in their own gold, and the day is saved. Next, we have Mercury in the 20th century. Unlike Hercules from the last video, this actually does appear to be based off of the Roman god Mercury. Mercury has to go to Earth to fight the wicked Pluto, who is in disguise as Adolf Hitler. Oh, uh, no, wait, I read that wrong. It's actually Rudolf Hendler. Very subtle, Marvel. Mercury basically tells everyone to stop fighting, and world peace is accomplished. Why didn't you just do that, current President Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Next up, we've got Comet Pierce Bite. Jack Kirby. I believe this is actually Jack Kirby's first credited work at Marvel. I'm told that he also did that Mercury story, but I didn't see his name in there. So that would mean this is the first time his name appears in print. If somehow you are watching this channel and you don't already know, Jack Kirby is gonna be a pretty major player in the Marvel story coming up soon. Uh, and if you don't know, buckle in, I guess. Pierce and Jort, two future pilots of some kind, crash their plane and get attacked by an eldritch beast. N no, not that beast. As a gift for something, a woman who's been following Pierce for some time grants him the power of the sun. He journeys through the entire solar system to find this mystery woman. He somehow discovered along the way that this woman is the rebel queen Lorena of the Martian Xeranthus. I don't really know what's going on here, but uh, it doesn't really matter anyway. That's it for Red Raven Comics number one, but wait a second. That wasn't the whole issue. The cover of this story explicitly made reference to multiple other characters that didn't appear. Where was the human top? Where was Eternal Brain? These characters must have been removed, and I've got to get to the bottom of why. This is a full-blown conspiracy, and I will not rest until I figure out the bottom of it. Actually, still don't know where I got these comics from. How about we just do one mystery at a time for now? Marvel Mystery Comics number 10. And now that we're back to familiar characters, I think we can stick a little closer to our 50 word limit. I won't lie, that lightning round kind of got away from me there. First, we have the conclusion to the fight between Namor and the Human Torch. Who will win? Who will lose? N no one. And they mutually decide to stop their fighting and go their separate ways. The whole conclusion is one page long. Well, that's... disappointing. We immediately cut to a Human Torch solo story that has nothing to do with the Submariner. Yeah, at least we got one good issue out of this thing. The Torch busts a gasoline profiteering ring, whatever that means. He threatens extreme violence to the perpetrators before he encases them in a fiery cage and reports them to the proper authorities. Namor returns to his ocean home where he's released from service due to his failure to kill the Human Torch. Meanwhile, a nearby sea captain decides to hunt down the Submariner himself. In retaliation, Namor grabs the nearest woman he can find and dives underwater. 
The fight ends in a draw, and Namor returns home. I can't even begin to describe what's happening with the angel. He's fighting ghouls, and you can tell they're ghouls because they turn to jelly when the angel tries strangling one. Angel goes down into the cracked earth from which they arrived, where he remains at the story's end. Wait, wait, he just stays there? In the molten lava? Isn't the angel just a guy? An evil doctor raises the dead using his new artificial blood. Yeah, that all checks out. He tells the army of olive skeletons to steal, plunder! The corpses attack and current President Franklin Delano Roosevelt personally wires Philozog for help. Electro fights a big monster, falls in corrosive acid, and saves the day. Now if you were concerned about the well-being of that evil doctor, don't you worry. Electro dunked him in the tank of flesh-eating acid. The Masked Raider returns with another convoluted tale of Western justice. This time a man kills and impersonates a tax collector, then frames the Raider for the crime. Raider decides that kidnapping the sheriff's daughter is the best way to crack this case, which of course, it is. Terry Vance, boy detective, is a brand new character in this issue. Terry and his monkey companion Dr. Watson investigate two murders that happen simultaneously. Vance soon determines the culprit to be an alarm clock tied to a mousetrap tied to a gun. It's always the ones you least suspect. Terry investigates further with the help of his new invention, a gaming headset. He overhears that the victim was a man with no will, so all his money passes to his annoying stepson. It turns out the stepson was the killer, and he also destroyed the will. Another case solved by the kid with a hundred hobbies. Kazar fights a plane. Sorry? You heard me. Kazar fights a plane, and then threatens to kill a man with a gun. Another very chill and normal Kazar story. The last little one page feature in this issue is called Our Hall of Shame, and it's a few jokes that I have to assume were funny at some point. Let's keep moving. Lightning round! Daring Mystery Comics number six starts off with the introduction of yet another new character. This is Marvel Boy, the story of Hercules reincarnated as a child. No, not that Hercules. Or that Hercules. Or even, surprisingly, that Hercules. Marvel Boy, at the age of only 14, defeats several Nazis with relative ease. Some green guy appears in this woman's remote cabin, drops off a baby, refuses to elaborate, and leaves. The green guys commit truly prodigious amounts of murder, and the baby is also evil? So the fiery mask, this is a fiery mask story by the way, uh, the fiery mask sits down and watches the baby transform in a pillar of fire into a huge monster and tries to kill a random woman? Here is an image of my face that I took as I read that section. The baby demon opens a portal to the demon world, which the mask jumps through. In the demon world, he's attacked by an enormous devil that blasts so much fire at the mask that he instantly awakes in his laboratory. Was this all a dream? I don't think so. Stuperman! We can't, we can't just move on. That was, that... No, we can't just... The man of the day after tomorrow. Go on with the story. We dare you. You're really gonna make me read Stuperman? Okay. Superman is an absurdist parody of Superman, but like, most of the story is focused on this guy who really likes exploding banks. This whole project's kind of been a lot for me, I'm not gonna lie. Captain Red Huff, pilot of the Flying Flame, gets kidnapped by enemy airmen. He escapes their prison by tearing apart the brick wall with his own two hands. I'm going back to bed. The captain hops back in the flame and obliterates any trace of the enemy. The Falcon fights a bunch of bank robbers and eventually turns them into the police. That one was admittedly pretty boring, but that was a welcome change of pace after the complete insanity of the previous issue. Our favorite magician, Monaco, saves a kidnapping victim with the use of his godlike powers. Somehow turning a building transparent and converting snakes into puppies doesn't feel quite as far-fetched as when he uses a plane to chase a car. Dynaman is another character introduced for the first time in this issue. He comes from the ancient kingdom of Korug, but ends up in ancient Egypt, where he, of course, meets the ancient Egyptian cavemen and dinosaurs. Friendly reminder that everything that happens in every single one of these comics is canon for the rest of time. So keep in mind for the rest of the Marvel Universe that there were canonically cavemen and dinosaurs living in ancient Egypt alongside the pyramids. Is Dynaman wearing cowboy boots? Anyway, the hero defeats all the cavemen known in universe as the Gurbans, and Egypt is saved. Here we have the story of the Tiger Man, another white boy who was abandoned in the jungle and was raised by the natives. Look, I know I keep going on about how much I hate Trojak, but like, at this point, just use Trojak. I mean, they literally call Trojak the Tiger Man. Anyway, this guy gets kidnapped by a tribe of, uh, I'm not actually sure what this is supposed to be. He makes it out along with the professor and his daughter. 
they jump in the river because I think their boat is sinking. The professor drowns and his daughter decides to stay with the tiger man forever, end of story. And that does it for issue number six. Now, looking ahead at my spreadsheet a little bit, that's actually gonna be the last issue of Daring Mystery Comics that we even read for a while. I'm really curious to know why they took such a long break, but my curiosity only extends so far and Google doesn't exist in 1939, so I'm gonna have to let that one slide for now. Plus, we're in the middle of a lightning round, so not a whole lot of time to think about this kind of thing. Hey, speaking of lightning round... Marvel Mystery Comics number 11 starts as usual with a Human Torch story. The Black Plague has made it to New York. Again? In an attempt to contain the disease before it spreads to the rest of the nation, Torch engulfs the slums of New York in flame. At the last possible second, Torch learns that the man behind the rackets is named J.B. I don't fully know what this is referring to, but I guess I'll... Figure it out in the next issue? American sailors fight the fish people in pursuit of the Submariner. Namor does his signature, kidnap a woman and then dive underwater with her move, and blows up a yacht. The Submariner's human captives escape by digging out of prison, but it turns out that was Namor's plan all along. The Masked Raider solves a string of burglaries. It turns out that the old lady with the chickens was friends with all the dogs, so she was able to just walk into people's houses and steal all their junk. Note to self, be friends with more dogs. Makes crime easier. This Kazar story has the first splash page we've encountered so far. This is definitely a historic moment, and honestly, the art in this section is really good, especially compared to what we're used to in this time period. Anyway, Kazar gets shot by a gun. Don't worry, he walks it off. Then he sneaks on a boat headed for America. What will happen next? Find out next time! Terry Vance gets in over his head with this case, and the bad guys are about to blow him up with TNT. He saves himself just in time to bust the bad guys and save the day. This was a lot more tame than the last boy detective story. Where was the clock tied to a mouse trap tied to a gun? The angel is still trapped underground with the horrifying monsters. While down there, he gets a quick change of clothes from an ancient Greek lady, complete with functional wings. At the touch of sunlight, the woman turns into a skeleton. A lot of people turn it into skeletons today. The angel uses his new wingsuit to escape the underground prison. Moving on, we have Electro, who has a fancy new TV face. This time, the robot has to single-handedly extinguish a forest fire. He does so using about 70 barrels of extinguishing chemicals and apprehends the arsonists. Next up is another issue of the same book. That's right, it's Marvel Mystery Comics number 12. The Human Torch, hot on the trail of the mysterious JB, and still wanted by police, decodes a secret message detailing a waterfront robbery. He arrives to discover that JB is Jane Bradley, daughter of a convicted white-collar criminal. He forces Jane to surrender, and the day is saved. I mean, I don't know what I expected, but the JB reveal definitely felt a little anticlimactic. Eh, what are you gonna do? Hey, why are you wearing that, bud? Namor decides to kidnap Lynn from the last couple issues so he can make her his bride. No, yeah, every part of this checks out. Lynn willingly goes along with the sea folks' plan to surgically turn her into a submariner, but suddenly Luther breaks in. I thought you were dead, you. What happens next? I think you get the idea at this point. The angel falls in some classic swamp quicksand and finds himself among evil monsters and giant vultures. The angel kills a man in one punch and ends the wicked spell put over this land. I guess we're just not gonna mention the last story. Very cool. The schoolboy sleuth pulls into an old castle to escape the rain. In the midst of a fancy dinner party, Dr. Watson finds a corpse. That monkey has seen some things. The murderer confesses immediately upon accusation. Seriously, he's like, couldn't have been me. And then Terry's like, but wait, there's mud on your shoes. And he's like, okay, fine, you caught me. Uh, he didn't even try to save himself. The case is solved right away. Sea piracy causes such concern that current President Franklin Delano Roosevelt decides he has to get involved. And by get involved, I mean personally wire Philo Zog and ask him to do it. Ah, so the usual. The leader of the pirates, called the Shark, wants to be the emperor of the seven seas because of course he does. The only one who can stop this and restore peace to the ocean is Electro, the marvel of the age. So Electro, using his robot punching ability, stops the shark and restores peace to the ocean. Philo Zog gets a presidential medal of honor. Well deserved. The masked raider changed to his mask color? Now hold on, if that's a different mask, how can I be sure that's the same raider? The raider comes up with a convoluted plan to stop some gangsters from forcibly making Texas its own country. Oh, nope, that's our guy, alright. He swaps out their explosive powder with fertilizer because he knows they were gonna tie him up. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it too hard. Just, just stop worrying about it. 
Don't even think about it anymore. Lightning round. Kazar hides out on the ship until right at the end of the story where he makes it to New York City. He kills some boaters before running through Central Park side by side with his lion brother Zar. We end with the lion's brother attempting to free every animal in the zoo. And that's it for this issue. Up next is something a little different. In some sort of baffling rebrand, Red Raven Comics changes its name to Human Torch Comics, starting in our next issue, Human Torch Comics, number two. As you might guess, this book is all about the Human Torch. Oh, well, mostly. In the first story, the Torch comes across a flaming boy named Toro. Basically, he's like a kid version of the Human Torch. Unlike the original Torch, who is a flaming android, Toro's pyrokinetic abilities are the result of a terrible train crash. After attempting to rescue his parents from smoldering wreckage, some strangers look at Toro and say, hey, this kid would rocket in the circus. The flame kid is not even slightly phased by the loss of his entire family and is filled only with excitement towards his new circus life. Cut to the present day where Toro proves his might as a hero when he stops a circus robbery with just his two blazing hands and also the help of the Human Torch. Okay, it doesn't sound as impressive if you put in all the details. Next up is actually another Submariner story. Uh, this one doesn't continue the story we've been following for the last few issues of Marvel Mystery, though, instead opting for another Namor in New York tale. The Submariner takes down some German rowers and saves a newly christened American ship from sinking with his patented planes with big magnets. Something that makes so much sense for Namor to have that, frankly, I'm shocked we haven't seen them yet. Namor defeats the Nazi saboteurs along with some sailors, and say it with me now... The day is saved. Not one, but two no-picture stories back-to-back, -back. so we're skipping through both of those, although they seem to be a little more interesting than usual. These recount fictionalized versions of the creation stories of both Human Torch and Namor. Anyway, back to the actual comics. The Falcon follows some kidnappers to their base using glow-in-the-dark paint and beats them all up. He doesn't accept thanks from the person he saves because the violence is its own reward. Oh, how comforting. Jimmy Everett the Microman is really very small. He's dime-sized. So tiny! That's it, he becomes normal-sized at the end, but that's no fun. Mantor the Magician. No, not Monaco the Magician, and definitely not Decor the Magician. Mantor is a totally unique and different character. Mantor uses his magic abilities to defeat two Scooby-Doo-style ghosts, complete with a cute little unmasking scene. Fun! Our last story of this issue follows our old favorite. The Fiery Mask. Oh please, I, I don't think I can take it. In this one, the mask uncovers a corpse with no blood. The mask's identity is discovered by a curious nurse, a character we will certainly see again. The mask beats up the culprit of the blood crimes, a mad doctor who's injecting himself with the blood as part of some strange experiment. Dark, but not quite as upsetting as the last issue, so consider me relieved. Up next, we've got our final issue of this lightning round. It's Marvel Mystery Comics number 13. Evil criminals are crashing the New York subway somehow, and the torch has to take them down. I don't have a lot to say about this story, so I'm just gonna move on. Can you imagine being a criminal thinking you finally got it made? The perfect crime, you're gonna get away with it. And then you see a man made out of fire chasing you down? Just give up. That's the kind of existential terror that will stick with you for a long time. Namor and Dorma decide to take Europe. They swim across the ocean in weird little masks to try and end World War II. How? It's not really clear. In any case, they stop an air raid and take some Nazis prisoner before the story comes to an end. And now we meet for the first time, the Vision. Do I even need to say it? Not that Vision. This story posits what we all already know to be true, which is that smoke is the window to other dimensions. Of course, of course. Some gangsters open a portal to an alternate dimension, from which steps Arcus, destroyer of evil, the Vision. He can freeze people solid with just his ghastly touch. Later, in his human form, the Vision is captured by the evil mobster Borelli. The criminal honors this prisoner's last request for one last cigarette before executing him, which would prove to be his fatal mistake. The smoke summons Arcus, the Vision. He beats up all the bad guys and the story ends. Terry Vance, kid detective, has to get to the bottom of an elaborate art heist. Once he finds their base of operations, he calls one of his newspaper buddies and the two children brutally assault the hardened criminals. I gotta say, I didn't think he had it in him. Philozog goes back to space in this issue's Electro story. He and his crew land on the moon, a feat never before accomplished in human history. On the moon, Electro encounters the alien Emperor Nor and his terrible moon robots. The human explorers land on the dark side of the moon to save a captured Electro, then kill Nor with explosives. 
the angel fights the forces of the crime boss Savoy. There is seriously an entire page of this comic that is just the angel one-shotting people with his fists. Savoy admits to his crime, not knowing that a telephone operator is listening in. He gets reported to the police and the angel throws him off a building. Lastly, we have Kazar in New York. Kazar gets taken in by the police for attempting to free all the zoo animals. He then holds a cop at gunpoint, forcing him to take the jungle dweller to the circus so he can free all the caged animals there. After some business with a woman from a previous Kazar story, the brother of Zar makes good on his promise to free the animals, and we end with the book asking us, will Kazar and Zar escape, or will they be shot by the police? Okay, uh... I guess that'll do it for the lightning round. Before we wrap up this video, there is still one more issue we have to talk about, and that is Marvel Mystery Comics number 14, cover dated December 1940. Starting off the final issue of the night, we have, as always, another Human Torch tale. Ronald's mansion gets exploded by the Tibetans. Not Ronald! It turns out Ronald has made a powerful enemy in a flame-controlling cult called the Firemen. Their leader attacks him, and the torch is unable to save him from the sinister fire whip. At their base, the cultists insist that Ronald was a terrorist, and that their act of violence has actually saved the world. Now, I know Ronald, and that is not Ronald. The torch comes face to face with a bright green one-eyed fire monster. Gulp! After defeating the monster, Torch decides that the firemen were actually telling the truth the whole time, and goes to help them in their quest against the fire monsters. What happens next? We'll figure it out in the next video. In this issue's Namor story, the Submariner swims to a secret Nazi island base. He ties all their submarines together, and then to a big rock. He then massacres the camp using hand grenades, and swims back across the ocean to meet up with his cousin Dorma. He then uses a seaplane to completely overturn the Nazi submarines. We start this Angel story with no context, just fighting. Classic Angel, I, I can't even be mad. He gets captured by the bad guys and learns about a fake diamond making racket. It'll tank the cost of real diamonds. Ooh, I, I could actually go for discount on those precious gems. Uh, m maybe we should just let this one slide. The Angel makes his accusation and responds to requests for proof by beating up the suspect. The police arrive just as the bad guys start tearing up the evidence, but aren't very effective and get arrested anyway. Another victory. For the angel. The vision is back, this time promised to face the dreaded werewolf. The monster attacks his doctor, but luckily the researcher drops his pipe and the vision arises from the smoke. The wolf kills the doctor and gets away. Look, in the vision's defense, he just appeared there. Nobody told him what was going on. It turns out that the werewolf's wife was also a werewolf, and then both the werewolves die and the vision didn't really do anything. Again, he just appears whenever there's smoke. Nobody is telling him what's happening. Terry Vance, Dr. Watson, and their reporter friend Deadline crash through a movie set. Also, how are they driving? Isn't Terry, like, a child? The star of the film gets kidnapped, and so our heroes have to save her. They chase the bad guys back to their hidden base, where the kid detective crawls through the pipes to beat up the bad guys. The day is saved, and the story ends. Electro! Say what you will about the guy, but you can't deny. He is the marvel of the age. Fairbanks Ironworks is being sucked into the bowels of the earth. What? Only Philo Zog and his amazing machine Electro can save the day. But it's not just the ironworks. Several buildings across town are disappearing beneath the planet's surface. Of course, this is all the work of a one-eyed subterranean monster. Who else? Philo Zog loses control of the robot, so he follows him underground in a big drill machine. There he discovers that the cave monsters are afraid of his flashlight. Just when things look bad for the scientist, Electro comes to the rescue and crushes the lead monster with a giant steel brick, then throws him into a chasm of fire. How else are you going to deal with mole monsters? For our last story of the video, Kazar escapes from New York. No, not that escape from New York. The police are hunting Kazar and his animal friends, prepared to use lethal force. The lion duo sneak onto a cargo ship bound for Africa. While the passengers are at first afraid, they understand completely when Kazar explains his story and allow him and the lion to stay on the boat with no additional questions. I'm glad we keep security so tight on this ship. The vessel gets attacked by a submarine's torpedo. Kazar and Zar, left with no alternative option, start to swim across the ocean back to their home. And that's every Marvel comic published in the year 1940. So, uh, what have we learned? Well, we learned that artificial blood has some actual scientific merit behind it. Uh, we learned that even the most intense of fights can end with just a simple conversation between enemies. That'll usually sort things out. And we learned that the most deadly killer of all is an alarm clock tied to a mousetrap tied to a gun. Tune in next time for more exciting Human Torch adventures, the early months of 1941, and the introduction of a Marvel A-lister that is still just as popular in the far-off future of 2024. Wait, that reminds me, I'm all out of comic books. I'm gonna have to actually travel forward to 1941 if I want to get my hands on this stuff. 
that could be a problem. I actually haven't tried going forward in time in this machine yet. Now if only I could figure out how to... This is really bad. Somebody's found me. I can't interact with the outside world. If I do, it might cause a rift in the timeline. It could change things forever. I, I don't know what could... Okay, I have no other choice. I'm gonna have to go out there and confront whoever it is that's knocking on my door. The next batch. <sighs> okay, that was, uh, interesting. Can't honestly say I expected that, although in retrospect, maybe I should've. I've got a lot of thinking to do before we next meet. I've gotta to get to the bottom of this. Who's sending me these comics? I'll devote the rest of my life to figuring this out. On well, the next month or so, at least. In the meantime, I've been Isaac. And if you need me, I'll be right here, investigating this case. Fortunately, I've got all the time in the world. Good night. <laughs>